गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन आई एम मोनिका कौशिक फ्रॉम दी अजीम प्रेमजी यूनिवर्सिटी एंड आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू द सेकेंड सिम्पोजियम ऑन बर्ड मॉनिटरिंग इन इंडिया आई डोंट थिंक आई नीड टू एम्फोसाइज द वैल्यू ऑफ बर्ड मॉनिटरिंग टू दिस ग्रुप एज यू ऑल आर इन्वॉल्व इन स्टडिंग और मॉनिटरिंग बर्ड्स यू आर ऑलरेडी इन टीम बर्ड्स फॉर फ्यूचर However the idea of the symposium is to first and foremost highlight the need of long term monitoring of birds across different habitat in India to different stakeholders and working together we can make a stronger case for bird monitoring and conservation therefore the symposium is uh, intended for all of us to first know each other uh, to help each other out encourage support each other through this symposium we are expecting that collaborations will develop organically between researchers institutions citizen scientists and different type of stakeholders people involved in bird monitoring can help in identifying location specific threats or emerging threats to the birds uh, challenges or limitations faced by them at different stages of bird monitoring suggest material or support required for improving their bird monitoring work The first bird monitoring symposium happened in 2021, and that was the first attempt and first of its kind symposium focused on bird monitoring in India. We received an overwhelming response from the participant. More than 400 individual registered for that symposium, and close to 135 were um, engaged throughout the throughout the symposium on the Slack and different platform we were using for communication. There were 19 invited talks and 16 contributed posters, encompassing a wide variety of uh, research questions and different type of bird groups. The invited talks shed light on some brilliant monitoring work by individuals and organization, um, encompassing work on raptors, hornbills, forest owlet, Himalayan passerines, and their uh, parasites. Results of um, avian uh, water birds and Asian water bird census. Highlights of the state of India's uh, bird report, to name a few. If you are feeling that you have missed out on these uh, talks, so don't feel bad. These all talks are archived on the Bird Monitoring uh, website under the tab Past Event. And if you are interested, I strongly encourage you to uh, go back and watch these videos. Maybe not today <laughs> when you have free time. Um, the first symposium also included a group discussion. about the future of bird monitoring studies in india uh, this group discussion identified specific challenges faced by individuals and organization um, in in the bird monitoring studies and the solutions were also provided by these uh, different groups um and this year also we have an exciting set of event lined up for two days we have keynote talk on both days uh, and we are really happy that both our keynote speakers are the well known women in their fields um we also have uh, two mini symposium on each day uh, followed by these keynotes um and these keynote speakers or the talks that we have will underscore the significance of first the bird monitoring in india and um i'll be talking in more detail about neha and neha will definitely be discussing in more detail about her work um um the mini symposium focuses on different methods for bird monitoring the first symposium um on the first day will actually has an amazing set of case studies using telemetry to study a wide variety of ecological question including including small and mighty birds Uh, do listen to the bird researchers and managing managers discussing the value of telemetry in the panel discussion as a part of the telemetry symposium i am certain that the session will help in facilitating more telemetry work in india which is really the need of the hour the mini symposium on the second day is something very close to my heart is a testament of collective citizen action to contribute to scientific knowledge on birds including uh, their spatial patterns seasonal changes and species trend over a geographical area the mini symposium include invited talks on atlases from mysore coimbatore pune and kerala followed by a moderated group discussion on different aspect of bird atlases including atlas design analysis public engagement stakeholder funding and tech 
cherries on the cake our poster session submitted by uh, our participant showcasing bird research and monitoring uh, effort by different individuals across from across the from across the country um and before i move forward and uh, um introduce our first speaker i will first announce some housekeeping um, um housekeeping announcement so first is take a look at our updated schedule for any last minute change there might be people dropping out uh, from the talks or not presenting a particular poster so please look out if there is any change um if you have a question do post your question to the speaker in the appropriate channel so you already know that we are using a discord we are using uh, a youtube we are uh, live streaming these talks so please use appropriate channel uh, for your question uh, to a particular person you can also use um, a at symbol for tagging the individual to whom the question is directed to the moderator for each session will also ask your question to the speaker and the speaker may also respond if the questions are uh, too many they can the speaker can use discord uh, to have a discussion after the talk so you will have all the time to ask your question even when the talk is over now uh, i also request preeti if uh, uh, to help me out if i missed on anything preeti do you want to add anything Uh, regarding the announcement or should i go ahead please go ahead i think we're good thank you thank you preeti um so our first speaker i don't think she require any introduction miss neha sinha is an award winning wildlife conservationist her work wild and willful is in the hindu's top 10 non fiction book of 2021 neha has studied biodiversity conservation at oxford university after winning an inlax scholarship neha heads conservation and policy unit at the bombay natural history society and is leading commentator on the environment and she regularly write for hindu um hindustan times bloomberg queen telegraph wire and others um working with bombay natural history society on policy and advocacy neha has provided valuable in inputs on amendment of wildlife protection act 1972 wetland rule 2017 compensatory afforestation fund act 2016 and tsr subramaniam high level committee to review environmental law 2015 and if you follow neha on twitter like me then you already know that she keeps a close eye on the birds uh, from her balcony as well and there is a beautiful uh, bombax siva tree somewhere close to her house <laughs> where uh, she might be looking at chirpy mynas or illies yellow footed green pigeon the way she describe uh, their behavior even nudges a non bird watcher to watch bird So today Neha is discussing a very relevant topic uh, of the role of bird research and monitoring activities on proposed changes in wildlife law and policy in three main pieces of legislation the Wildlife Protection Act the Conservation the Forest Conservation Act and the Biodiversity Act and I'm pretty sure you are eagerly waiting for her talk so without any further ado I now welcome Ms Neha Sinha and invite her for her talk thank you Neha Thank you so much, Monica. Such a pleasure to be introduced by you, and such a pleasure to see young women, so many young women in this symposium. I am going to start sharing my screen. So we are talking today about whether bird monitoring influences policy in India. So there's a question mark in the title, as you can see. And when I say bird monitoring over here. i'm using it as a very wide term it can uh, mean bird monitoring done by a particular organization it can mean bird monitoring done by citizen groups uh, it can also mean bird monitoring done by more amateur people who are trying to save perhaps a wetland or an important bird area near their uh, near their place and um, uh, for the purposes of conservation practice we don't always have perfect data sets and uh, uh, we have an opportunity in india to actually create better uh, data sets and i really hope that one of the takeaways from this talk in this symposium can be inspiration for all of us me included to contribute to better data sets uh, on birds so that we can actually influence policy I'm going to start with this amazing piece of news um and I'll come back to it a little later. 
This is just a couple of days ago. The Gujarat Energy Department has proposed that four Great Indian Bustards, female Great Indian Bustards in Kutch, which is in Gujarat, should be relocated to Rajasthan. And uh, the context over here is the fact that the Great Indian Bustard is an iconic bird of arid grassland and scrub forest. And this is a bird that has been lately uh, a symbol for our um, for our conservation uh, interventions that we're trying to make in this threatened ecosystem. It is uh, the state bird of Rajasthan. It is also the um, it is also the symbol or the mascot for the Convention on Migratory Species of which India is a part. I'll just get back to it a little later in this presentation, but I just want you to tuck away this piece of information that Gujarat Energy Department wants four of the wild Great Indian bustards to be moved to Rajasthan because they think that these birds are getting in the way of this electrification and power line project that Gujarat is trying to do. Okay. Now, this is actually a very pertinent topic that we're talking about today because the government has recently uh, attempted to change three important uh, laws connected with the environment. On the left is an op-ed that I wrote in the Hindustan Times, which talks about the Forest Conservation Act of India 1980, which uh, talks about what kind of, um, you know, what, what, what should be the clearance processes or the protection processes for forests in India. Now, forest legislation is something that is very old. Now is also the time for us to talk about grassland legislation and uh, legislation also for other ecosystems that may not be forest. Uh, but coming back to forest, because that is the kind of bedrock for our uh, environmental legislation, legislation history. The Forest Conservation Act is being changed. The Wildlife Protection Act is being changed. The Biodiversity Act is being changed. And I'll just come to the changes in a bit. Uh, I understand that law and policy doesn't interest everybody, but I do think it is important for us to get a sense of what is the narrative the government is trying to create? What are the aims of the government? Why do they want to change the laws? Are the laws being changed in order to enable conservation or are they being changed to enable clearances? We've just had the bill for the Wildlife Protection Act introduced in the Lok Sabha. And following uh, a bunch of uh, representations from civil society, uh, the bill was taken to the Parliamentary Standing Committee of Science and Environment. Because uh, earlier, the bill was just taken to the Lok Sabha without any public discussion. So I don't need to underscore here that any change in laws should have public consultation. It should have expert consultation. And other than expert consultation, it's important to also involve citizens. It's not necessary that only experts need to have the last voice on the change in a law, but also citizens. So if you are a citizen who lives near a wetland or a, or a mangrove or a swamp, you know, you may have certain ideas about how wildlife should be treated in our legislation. So if you see the previous headline, this is another piece that I wrote, um, um, what explains the center's haste to amend our laws? So both the Biodiversity Act as well as the Wildlife Protection Act were brought to the parliament without any public consultation. And uh, we've actually made a bunch of representations to the parliamentary committee now. But just to say that you know the Wildlife Protection Act puts the wild animals and birds of India in schedules. So schedule one is the most protect, most protected, schedule two is a little less protected. But in the even in the new bill, which is of last year, that's 2021, we have a whole bunch of birds and animals missing. And this brings us to the question, do we have agreement of what are the birds we have in India? It's a really simple question, but it's a question that bears a little bit more thinking. Because you and I, as people who are interested in birds, may agree that there are 1,300 plus bird species in India. We may agree on a particular list of birds or a particular bibliography of birds, 
But does the government know this? Does the policy maker, the MLA, the member of parliament, you know, the person in the real world who is interacting with and creating policy, do we have an agreement that these are the birds we have in India? Uh, do they want to know? Is, is, it, is it important for us to keep highlighting that these are the birds we have? And if people don't know, is it important to bring that to their notice? So for example, these are some birds which are really endangered, but they're not there in the new schedule of, of the Wildlife Protection Act. And you know, the, the original Wildlife Protection Act was 1972. So that's like 40 years ago. So obviously the act does need um, updating, but you may ask whether the mass print foot is still found in India. I would say it's historic range and there could be a few individuals and therefore it, it should reflect in, in the schedules of the act. Uh, even the gray crown plenia, for example. But, you know, this brings us to a very basic existential question. Do we have agreement on what birds we have in India? And if we have, as scholars, we agree on what birds we have, but somehow it doesn't make its way to you know, the Parliament of India, uh, to people who are actually making the law. So that's something for us uh, to think about as we go forward. There's also the Biodiversity Act of uh, 2002, which is being amended. And while it doesn't deal with birds um, directly, it, it does you know, bring about sweeping changes that are in uh, pursuit of building a better Ayurvedic or pharmaceutical industry. There's a lot of changes that suggest that um, uh, wild resources, biological resources such as a medicinal flower, such as you know, uh, any component of a plant which is used for uh, medicine or any other kind of commercial use can be used much more easily. I don't want to get into it too much over here, but the message is that the wide representations made on the new biodiversity bill uh, made by environmentalists stress the fact that it is going to be easier to take biological resources without informing the state biodiversity board. So this is indirectly something that is going to impact birds because birds do depend on wild plants and plant um, and trees. There are also Forest Conservation Act changes that are proposed, and this I'll get into with a little bit more detail. So uh, the Forest Conservation Act uh, lays out a clearance regime for forests. Under which circumstances do we clear or divert forests for any kind of project? And the highlight of the change they want to make in the Forest Conservation Act is to give right of way to highways and to railways. And amongst a wildlife that gets impacted by uh, highways and railways, birds are also one of the taxa that, that get impacted. We have vultures, for example, regularly dying, uh, being hit by trains. And you know, even things like um, a ropeway project, which appears to be very you know, benevolent, can impact bird habitat depending on where it's being made. So a lot of ropeway projects, for example, are typically in places with gorges and those big, big rocks, which, which are cliff nesting sites for birds, etc. And uh, other than this, um, there's also a proposal to exempt extended reach drilling, which is for oil and gas, and surveying for oil and gas to exempt that from the Forest Conservation Act, which means that if these activities are, are done, uh, the, the project developer should not need to get any permission from the government, the Ministry of Environment, because these, uh, these activities, such as extended reach drilling, survey and investigation for oil and gas, are being painted as um, very benevolent processes which don't actually harm forest. So we have a narrative being made that certain industrial activities do not actually harm the wild habitat in which many of you know, the, the, the wildlife that we study actually stays. Of course, you know, other than all of these legislative or policy changes, we also have, you know, this amazing citizen uh, science and bird monitoring movement um, in India. So the state of India's bird report, this, this piece is actually about that, uh, you know, is of course a product of 
of all of this um, effort coming together. So is the Kerala Bird Atlas, which is absolutely a magnificent piece of work. And uh, uh, so are many other smaller, you know, uh, initiatives that don't always get, uh, you know, they, they don't always get well known. You know, there are, uh, for example, Wild Visa conducts these riparian, you know, bird counts every year. There's, of course, the Asian Water Bird Census. These are very old and established um, uh, you know, initiatives. And again, we must ask, you know, in a country that's so vibrant, with so many people interested in birds, this is really the hope for tomorrow. At the same time, we, we must work harder at taking these findings to the policymakers, because we, at this point, we don't even agree on which birds we have in India. Um, this is a, a little map made by my colleagues at the BNHS. Uh, the Veterans Department has made this map, which um, basically, you know, looks at uh, uh, bird recovery, uh, either ringing or satellite tagging. And uh, the birds, of course, are moving between India and China and India and Central Asia. But the most beautiful part of all of this, BNHS has been ringing birds for more than 90 years now. The most beautiful part of all of this is that it involves citizens. It involves people who uh, are, you know, who may see the bird, a bird watcher who, who takes a photograph of the bird and uh, helps in understanding and creating this living map. Because this is actually, this map I'm showing is a 2D map, but in reality, it's a living document because the birds are constantly moving. And um, the coming together of a, of a, of, a, of a project that is created in, with particular research design that involves citizens and involves um, bird watchers or other researchers who are interested in birds is a very, very uh, wonderful collaboration, which really should show the way forward for many other taxa, not just birds. And um, this is an important constituency that we have over here. And I, I really hope that you know, we can use this constituency to further some of the mandates and goals that India has. So one of the mandates that India does have, which has, is a recent development, is uh, on the Convention on Migratory Species. So there was the last meeting of the Convention on Migratory Species was held in Gujarat, in India. And uh, it was decided that India is going to be the secretariat, the head office, for the Central Asian Flyway. So the map you saw the, uh, behind uh, the previous slide was actually the Central Asian Flyway. So uh, we are in part of the Central Asian Flyway. I'm sure you're already aware. And India is an important, uh, very important country for this flyway because we are, a, we are the biggest landmass before the Indian Ocean. And most of the birds, 90% of critical stopover sites are in India for the Central Asian Flyway. So the Indian government is creating the secretariat, which is going to do all the coordination and collaboration between all the different countries on this flyway. This is important because it gives a kind of visibility to this flyway, which it didn't have earlier. So the other flyways of the world have always had more visibility, more funding, and more coordinated action. It's also interesting because India is part of a neighborhood which doesn't always get along. And I know you may feel that this is not connected to bird conservation, but it really is. And uh, I'm just going to get to the, uh, the topic of the Great Indian Bustard, which also is part of the CMS because the Great Indian Bustard moves between India and Pakistan. And we don't talk to each other. And uh, uh, similarly, you know, there are birds that move between India and China, and there are some problems over there. Having said this, all of this, it is still important to have a framework that binds us and a framework that you know, gives us uh, you know, a kind of mandate to move forward on these difficult issues. So um, coming to the issue of the Great Indian Buster, this is my first case study on, on whether bird monitoring influences policy. And you know, uh, the Great Indian Buster has been studied off and on for at least 30 years. And you know, our generation has witnessed the decline of this bird from you know, uh, central uh, India, the Deccan Peninsula, to now just mainly Rajasthan and Gujarat. And um, uh, in April 2021, last year, exactly a year ago, the Supreme Court of India said that power lines in the Great Indian Bustard habitat must be taken underground. 
because of course as you know the bird you know collides with power lines and it dies and the entire place um, the entire place that this bird lives in of course is um grassland i'm just showing you this i, I know you already know about it that's just such a beautiful thing to see this kind of waving grassland with the uh, chinkara standing at the back and you know it's really important my previous slide i had written this is not a forest um this is not a forest story and this is important because when policy makers see this kind of landscape they think it's a degraded land and we actually have we are part of the united nations convention to combat desertification so desertification it gets confused with desert so a natural desert of course is not degraded other areas which are not natural deserts may get degraded into a more desert form but a natural desert or a natural you know dry grassland of course is not a degraded ecosystem and these are all kind of ideas that we have to work hard at dismantling so this area which has great indian bust it looks like this it looks brown and um, in order to save this place we also have to create value for how this looks and how you know it um, should be protected so um there are these giant massive power lines that are coming up in both thar and kutch and you know when you see this you know it's like basically hundreds of kilometers long it's a mesh it's a mesh of wires and uh, birds are dying all the time great indian busters are dying and so are other birds so this is what our bnhs uh, bustard uh, team has found uh this map shows the collisions of um, uh, different bird species and power lines and this is also done you know along with locals so the bird monitoring doesn't isn't always just people you know with smartphones sometimes it's also more old fashioned in some parts of india it could be people calling you up and saying there's a bird that's died please come and see of course the aim is to get everybody on and making bird list but sometimes bird monitoring can also be much more you know old fashioned depending on which part of india we are we are in or what the local circumstances are but if you just look at this map power lines are not just killing great indian busters they're also killing eagles they're killing even rock pigeon which is such a small bodied bird right so big birds and small birds both it's killing uh, uh migratory species like the steppe eagle it's killing uh resident species like the egyptian vulture and uh cranes so big birds small birds resident birds migratory birds this is only one small area in the thar it would be killing many more birds in the in the larger landscape now the thing is where, why am i telling you this i'm telling you this because the great indian mustard is a bird that has been monitored it is a bird that's continually being monitored it's a bird that is critically endangered with 100 about 100 120 left in the world that we know of uh, we are not able to work with pakistan under the cms so whatever we do domestically for this bird will tell us what the future of this bird is going to be now what is the policy response so last year's supreme court order it said take the power lines underground was completely flouted okay so this is a report that we did uh which which gave all the details of the violations of uh, the supreme court order basically the supreme court said don't make power lines or take power lines underground and as a result uh, in trying to quickly you know territorialize uh, these power companies just kept making illegally they kept making all these power lines and they started coming up overnight so between last year between april last year and this year there's been a lot of new construction of power lines and uh, i'll just take you back to that slide over here on the right you see you know um these birds obviously you know sometimes they're flying in a solitary way and sometimes they're flying in flocks and both flocks and solitary birds like the gib are getting uh, are getting uh, into the wires colliding with them and dying so if i go back to the very very first slide that i showed you which um has the gujarat energy department talking about translocation so 
any of us who study birds will understand that Gujarat and Rajasthan are not far for birds. So even if you take the birds to Rajasthan, they are going to fly back to Gujarat. The point here is that uh, the government currently is trying to say that we need to have more green power because that is our climate change commitment as per the Glasgow Agreement. And therefore, we must you know, lay these solar and wind farms in these desert areas. And um, I think they want to basically remove the GIB or, or basically say that, you know, this is a cost that we should be willing to pay. And this is something we all need to kind of guard against. This kind of creation of a narrative that a wild bird is better off, you know, just flying away somewhere. So the, the, what they try to say is that we are going to make this project here and the bird will take care of itself. For a bird like this, which has such a small existing habitat, this is not something that can happen. It can't just take care of itself and just disappear somewhere. It kind of has nowhere else to go. But this is a good example of how narratives get made. And it's important to understand and intervene you know, in these narratives. So we should be able to say that this bird doesn't really have anywhere else to go. And climate commitments, uh, and I'll just show you this uh, one piece that I wrote which basically questioned that we cannot basically fit our anti-coal goal, our goal to not have coal, we cannot fit that against the future of the great Indian bustard. So a climate commitment cannot come at the cost of species extinction. And for this bird, you know, again, a great example of, 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 of a bird that may actually go extinct in our lifetimes if we don't intervene. It's not a sensational headline to say the GIB may actually go extinct if we don't uh, you know, act now. And still, you know, the policy response is very, very uh, undesirable at the moment. So we need to keep intervening with new data, data of collision, data where the bird is going, data what suitable habit habitat is left and how we can secure that habitat by taking lines underground. Wildlife Institute of India is working very hard on advocacy, uh, so is BNHS, so is the Corbett Foundation in taking wires underground because constantly these birds are dying. We had the last bird death just a few days ago in Jaisalmer uh, of a female GIB. Uh, coming to another, uh, another um, small case study, a little smaller in its scope. This is uh, just to emphasize also the GIB story is about how despite being an international symbol and also a national symbol, uh, a bird like the Great Indian Bustard, which, which gets funding, which gets attention, still you know, hits a policy blind spot. But there are also a few different challenges that we have in, in terms of setting policy or in terms of doing conservation. And one of those is um, the interstate uh, or the transboundary nature of wild habitat or ecosystems that we try to protect. This is the case of the Najafgarh Jheel, which is um, in Delhi. And in this map, uh, that dark blue thing in the middle is actually the Jheel. And it's actually part of a river called the Sahibi River. So there's an expert committee made uh, for Najafgarh Jheel of which I am a part. And I just want to tell you that uh, there's another orange line that goes through the Jheel, which is actually the state boundary of Delhi and Haryana. So most of the water of Najaf Kajil is in Haryana. And uh, Delhi and Haryana don't get along, just like Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, and the case of the Pulikat Lagoon. And this is the case uh, of many water bodies in India, where you know, there may be two state boundaries, or you know, there may even be two different districts uh, of the same state, which don't say eye to eye. But uh, I also want to show you through this map. This is a map that we submitted as part of our expert committee recommendations. So you have Najaf Garjil, but you know, a wetland never is a wetland just by itself. It's part of a bigger complex, right? So if you look towards the south of the map, you have the Sultan Bird Sanctuary on the very left. You have a water treatment plant in the middle, sort of in the middle, and that's also an important site for birds. And on the right, you have a private area, which uh, where there's fishing, it's called Basai Wetland. So in this small landscape, um, you know, which is an agrarian part of Delhi and Haryana, you have the Najaf Jheel, which, which is formed by the Sahibi River. You have the Sultan to Bird Sanctuary, which is a national park and protected. You have a water treatment plant and you have a private 
wetland. Now in this area, uh, you have so many birds coming. And this is one of actually the richest birding spots in Delhi NCR. And I'm showing you the common crane just because, you know, uh, you may not assume that the common crane comes to Delhi, but it really does. Because this is a photograph I took um, near, uh, near next to Najafgarh and uh, in January, I think. And uh, a whole bunch of cranes come here apart from raptors and a lot of birds and there's a lot of e-bird data for Najafgarh and it's also a good example of how you know we must keep making bird lists we must keep updating our knowledge we must keep you know uh, uh, bringing more people in as much as is possible so whatever we've been able to do for Najafgarh you know where now we've made an environmental management plan from Delhi side and Haryana has made one too. Now it's not perfect because we are not living in a perfect situation or condition, but the bird data has richly contributed to uh, the, the management plans. And we actually have a lot more bird data than we have for butterflies or dragonflies or mammals because birds just are a studied taxa. Having said that, because it's a landscape which is part of the NCR, the National Capital Region. You, we, we may be able to save Najafgarh, but right next to Sultanpur, actually right on the eco-sensitive zone of Sultanpur National Park, we have these new projects coming up, you know, which are uh, hospitals and real estate and housing, which is a looming threat that not only do cities have, it's also a looming threat for a lot of farmland. And, you know, I think uh, personally, I feel farmland is the next frontier for uh, the conservation um, battle, so to speak, because, you know, farmland is so important for birds and yet it doesn't get valued as, as, a, as a bird habitat. And uh, all kinds of, you know, changes happen in farmlands. Often it's private land and, uh, you know, one can only work there uh, in with consensus of whoever the owner is and it's very difficult to prevent land use change but I, i'm just you know this example of Najafgarh and sultanpur is to make you think at a landscape level and you know even if we have one tiny win for Najafgarh, you have another threat coming up for sultanpur and to consider that these wetlands are actually wetland complexes and wetlands have a zone of influence uh, is, is something that we are still trying to convince policymakers of because they tend to see a wetland just as one thing. They don't tend to see a wetland in relation with other wetlands. And over here, again, bird data is important because we are able to monitor that the birds move from Basai to Najafgar, from Najafgar to Sultanpur. And all of this is generated by studying the birds and making the data accessible and also peer reviewed. Um, these are my eco clubs in Nagaland. Um, I am showing you this for a bit of inspiration. I run the Moon Falcon project along with Bano Haradu in that, uh, Nagaland. And these kids, you know, didn't know anything about birds. They still have a long way to go. But, you know, the idea for these kids really is that they are going to start monitoring birds. And they are going to give us information and data that we can use to, to find out where birds go, which are the sites we need to protect, which are the minimum number of sites that we should be actually conserving. Uh, and Nagaland has a lot of wetlands. It has a lot of paddy fields. So it has both you know, uh, agrarian uh, diversity as well as wetland diversity at the same time. Uh, you know, Birds have been traditionally hunted in, in this part of the world, but, um, I'm showing you this to say that bird monitoring is one soft step towards conservation. And it, it, is not, it is not an intervention that appears to be too difficult. It, it, it's something that's a scientific and an educational tool, which can very easily be converted into a much stronger and more decisive step for conservation. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of the interest in birds and in conserving them and the fight you know that we need to do to conserve them starts with this educational recreational uh, and cultural step of bird monitoring and bird uh, just bird watching and uh, learning the names and then learning to monitor them and uh, i'm going to end on a happy note because you know happy notes are very rare in our field but it's good to 
have them once in a while. So the legal initiative for forest and environment uh, has been fighting a case for the Soam Teta wetlands in Andhra Pradesh for the last uh, 13 years. And sometimes the fight for these kind of cases does take 10, 11, 12, 13 years. And uh, the local bird watching community, uh, the Indian Bird Conservation Network, and to some extent the BNHS have been contributing bird information for the site. And uh, the case was earlier against the thermal project, which would destroy this entire set of wetlands over there. Uh, that project was scrapped and uh, they wanted to then make a, a special industrial zone on top of the wetlands. And uh, SACON was asked to give a report and they gave a really good report, which uh, basically detailed all the birds that are found there. And no doubt their report was enriched by, you know, all the bird watchers who had made lists for that area. And the most interesting part is, and I don't know if it's true, I'm not going to say that it is, because I don't know, the most interesting part is they said that the pink headed duck may have been seen here at some point. And now the question is not if the pink headed duck is in Sompeta. The question is uh, similar to the masked pinfoot is whether, you know, whether we need to save an area with the hope that it may get colonized by a particular species. So uh, even for the masked pinfoot, which I don't know if we have in, in the mangrove ecosystems of Sundarbans, but we still need to keep the Sundarbans, you know, in the hope that one day, perhaps if the mass pinfoot decides to come from Bangladesh, it, it, it may come. So the judgment for Som Peta actually mentions the pink-headed duck. Uh, and, you know, the courts haven't said that the pink-headed duck exists, but it just says that you know, there, there may have been one record and we need to keep this area safe for posterity. And we have the wetland rules of 2017. The only problem with the wetland rules is it's a wetland only if the government says it's a wetland. So it may have water, it may be like drowning, uh, you know, it may be submerged the whole year round, but only if the government says it's a wetland does it get registered as a wetland. This judgment is really important because A, it uses a wetland atlas created by the ISRO of uh, the Space Research Organization, which has used satellite data, which is technology to map wetlands. Uh, so this judgment says all those wetlands that have been satellite mapped have to be considered water bodies, even if they're not part of the wetland rules, as in, even if they're not notified as wetlands by the state. And the second thing that's important is uh, we know as uh, researchers and as scientists or as enthusiasts that um, oftentimes we see an ecosystem and policymakers can't. So just like the Great Indian Bustards Desert is seen as a degraded agricultural area or, or an area that should be greened with trees, uh, we see a wetland and a wetland complex and they don't see it. So this judgment is important because it sets the path for saying that at least places with water that have been identified in that atlas, the Israel atlas, should be considered as water bodies even if they are not notified as wetlands. And it's an important step. Uh, it's an important direction for us to take. And also the fact that the that SACON did a great report, which was full of birds, has really helped this case. And yeah, I, I don't know if there's a pink-headed duck in India, but um, it's interesting that it makes an appearance in this judgment. The idea then being that we save the habitat and who knows you know, what kind of bird uh, composition you may have in that area. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Neha. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, this amazing talk and the wonderful work you are doing. Some of the, I mean, I was still lost <laughs> in your talk from the uh, familiar examples of Najafgarh. And I could also, I mean, I, there were other wetland that were coming to my mind. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Neha, we do have a few questions for you. So I'll just uh, quickly take those questions. Uh, Praveen is asking, bird monitoring in India and elsewhere contribute to a lot of red listing by IUCN. 
what is the penetration of actual IUCN red list into the policies in India, our acts and its legal usage? Is it mentioned somewhere in the formal documents? Has it been used in judgments? So we use the Wildlife Protection Act schedules more than we use the IUCN red list as far as policymakers are concerned. So uh, that's why the new Wildlife Protection Act schedules are so important. And that's why I've started by showing you the birds that are not there in the Wildlife Protection Act, because we don't even seem to have consensus. I mean, the policymakers don't seem to agree on which birds we even have in India. So uh, the government tends to use the Wildlife Protection Act as the basis. But having said that, the IUCN Red List is also used in documents to say this is critically endangered and uh, or you know is endangered and um, it's i think it's very important for us to have our own indian list and i'm sure you'll agree monica that you know regional lists are not always so useful yeah right so the black neck crane is a good example it's there in bhutan but in india it's only there in a couple of places it's only in arunachal and um, you know around the ladakh area so for India, what India should do for black neck crane as an example, you know, it doesn't need to be connected, you know, with what the global population is. Because, uh, you know, if we lose a couple of sites in India, then we kind of lose the bird, right? So I think it's important for us to actually work on our own uh, domestic lists, which should feed into the Wildlife Protection Act. And in my personal opinion, the Wildlife Protection Act should be updated every five years. So, you know, from 1972 to 2021, you know, it's been so many years and even now it's not complete. So we've all given the recommendation that uh, we should have a greater consensus and a greater expert or even citizen, uh, uh, you know, uh, group of meetings for the schedules of the act. And many plants are missing. Let's not even get into reptiles and fish. Like they're really not there. So we need, uh, you know, ornithologists, botanists, ethnozoologists, um, uh, fish people, all kinds of people in, in the room. And we need to have a full uh, consultation before the schedules are finalized. Yeah. We have another question from Lakshmi Kant Nive. Lot of work by BNHS and others. Bird data is available, scientific studies, paper are available, but day by day bird count is lowered down. Why? something going wrong in policy making effort for bird conservation yeah i agree and you know that's what that's why it's so sad you know we actually do have so many dedicated bird scientists bird researchers bird watchers this country is so rich we are so blessed to have thousands of people interested in birds but uh, you know uh, like I said, there are these narratives that the government likes, you know, because it's like we must have development at any cost, you know, and the cost is paid by the wildlife, right? And I, that's why I went into the Great Indian Bustard example with so much detail. So to see what we're doing to this bird, you know, and we are the last bastion for the GIV, right? If we lose GIV, then it's gone. Then it's just going to be in the enclosures and captive breeding facilities. Right. The problem is that we want to grow, but we're not willing to grow slowly. We're not willing to grow carefully, you know, and which is why we have this crazy, insane projects like interlinking of rivers, you know, making giant dams in the Himalayas, even though Himalayas have rock slides and mud slides every year, you know, destroying the coastline by making port after port. There's a new threat to Kaliwali Harbor. Kaliwali, as in, it's not a harbor, it's a natural harbor, but they want to make harbors in Kaliwali, which will destroy this Olive Ridley turtle nesting site, as well as it's an important bird area. It, it gets thousands and thousands of migratory birds. So on one hand, we are the office for the Central Asian Flyway, and on the other hand, we want to destroy all the, all the sites for these large projects. And the idea always is the bird will move. Which is why Gujarat is also saying, let's move the birds to Rajasthan. It will go somewhere, you know. And uh, uh, for the uh, Kane Betwa River interlinking, that's also important because it's going to drown 100 kilometers of Panna Tiger Reserve. But it's also going to impact these beautiful cliffs that are used by gyps vultures. Anyone who's gone to Panna, I'm sure you've seen those gorgeous gorges. And those gorges and cliffs are really unique. Those rock escarpments are so unique to that landscape. So for them to be underwater is such a shame. 
especially because panna was revived it had lost all its tigers in this long revival process so i think as citizens we should all try to counter as much as possible the idea that development can happen at any cost right and we should go for smaller projects that don't have such huge impacts yeah. okay um we have a question from kirti i don't know uh, whether it is uh, something that you will be able to answer neha or not but are there mlas and mps who are active birders or how can people uh, at their level be roped in into this activity um yeah there are you know and i think it's a good question because we shouldn't leave it up to others to reach out to our policy makers we should try to rope everybody in and in a way birds are pretty harmless now imagine if we were all working on venomous snakes our work would be much harder and so when i'm feeling demotivated i tell myself thank god i work on a taxa which generally people find appealing and generally people don't hate you know so nobody can actively hate you know a migratory fly catcher for example it's so harmless so um it's really important i cannot emphasize how important it is to rope in our local legislators and uh, even the work for the wildlife protection act that we are doing has been working with parliamentarians so we have depots in front of parliamentarians for both the biodiversity act and the wildlife protection act and we are hoping to engage with their heads and their hearts also by saying you know bharat ki chidiya hai you know godavan bharat ki chidiya hai it's not something that we can expect anybody else to save and uh, therefore definitely you know if we have a chance please reach out uh, you know local groups of bird watchers are actually doing phenomenal work in many parts of india in uh, roping in their local leaders and at the end of the day let's understand that laws and policies get made in ministries and in parliament we are not the ones who are making it we are standing at the door giving our inputs but it's a long process even judges of the courts you know uh, are a constituency that we should try to reach by doing outreach by writing articles taking photographs my entire twitter you know honestly i don't get time for it but my entire twitter is just to show that oh look it's a beautiful bird take the picture i don't care you know take my picture i don't want to uh, i don't want anything from it but it's a beautiful bird and uh, sometimes it does work so please if you can you know if you're doing bird watching in the morning maybe invite your mla to uh yeah you know, to just come and walk with you to give you a talk give them tell them about nest boxes tell them about giving out water for birds any it would be any activity really you know it's really really important we are a very big country and our country's focus is always going to be on people it's never going to be on wildlife because there are too many people in india and too many developmental challenges so it's really important we are not above this we must engage with policy makers uh, i i know we are running uh, out of time neha this is the last question that i'm going to take and maybe then you can take questions on uh, i think other channels um what i is asking policies are hard to implement and should be based on evidence we do have good data on causes of decline in many bird example gypsy vultures have been studied really well in last 20 years and supposedly one day um, uh, they the keep program of the bnhs my question is despite knowing the cause of decline in vulture why is it so hard to ban drugs what else need to be done that can help the process beyond conservation breeding yeah uh neeta shah has been instrumental in this it's not me um, i cannot take any credit for the vulture work uh shnita has been absolutely instrumental in banning diclofenac for veterinary use but now we have a new clutch of drugs which also seem to be fatal for vultures so nimesolide for example and uh, you know whenever we have spoken to the government and to different ministries not environment but different ministries you know we've been told that um this is something for human welfare and they are not able to even see why we need to ban it for for animals and even if it gets banned for animals the human equivalent gets used for the animals and uh, it's a really difficult question and i think uh, you know uh, in some places we do see vultures coming back i think it's this is also a cultural it has to be seen as a cultural change which will take time 
so people are understanding that vultures have gone locally extinct in so many parts of india and i think uh, understanding target groups is really important the para vet is a very important target group of course so are policy makers so are school children but para vets and vets and farmers and therefore the advocacy work for vultures has focused on you know going to places going to veterinarians and going to chemist shops to tell them don't stock this but at the end of the day behavioral change requires consent from the person you're trying to change as well and i think i think the vulture story is actually a positive story today because even though the decline is steep i think a, there's a little bit of stabilization of population and as we find more and more drugs that are bad for vultures i think we need to focus more on the cultural aspect the pride aspect you know the jatayu aspect because you know why should somebody care you know i spoke to people and told them bird is going extinct they're like mujhe kya farak padta hai and it's a very good question like why should that person care and in order to create that feeling that is a loss you know it takes time and uh, the the work done by nita and some of the others for vultures chris bowden and uh, many of my colleagues dr gripu prakash have been phenomenal because they've created value for a bird that's seen as a, uh, ugly um whatever superstition you know some superstition around vultures and it's not an easy bird to to like but the work that they've done has been phenomenal and i think we're all working together to create a value for the bird which is also cultural and i think we are i think there's hope for the vulture in india today even if more and more drugs are found to be fatal i think we're coming to a point where we can agree that we should we should be banning all the drugs which are bad for them at least for animal use yeah thank you so much neha for giving us hope <laughs> at the very end <laughs> and also during your talk there were snippets of hope thank you um, duck <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> i was so surprised to see that in the judgment yeah <laughs> thank you once again neha and uh, now uh, i mean the questions that we have i think we'll be posting you on the whatsapp and you can answer sure. them um, sure and uh, here guys we are going to break out for a very small break break 10 minutes break and uh, nishant kumar will be the moderator for the next session which is on telemetry and there are some exciting amazing talks lined up so i really encourage all of you to stay back take a break have a glass of water come back Thank you so much for having Thanks, me. Thanks, Neha. I'll be around. Yeah. Bye.